you've got a Bible, I want you to go ahead and open it up to Deuteronomy. We're going to be starting this study tonight or today in Deuteronomy chapter 31. So you can be flipping open if you've got a paper Bible to Deuteronomy 31. If you're following along in the Calvary Ministries mobile app, all of that scripture is right there in front of you. But today we're going to talk about transition. We're going to talk about leadership transition. We're going to talk about how an organization, a church, a corporation goes from one leader to the next. I started working on this sermon four weeks ago, and four weeks ago, I read a book called Next. It was written by Blair and Vanderblumen, and this book looks at how 200 churches in America did the transition from one pastor to the next, hence the title. And here's what they learned. The writers of this book said, for the most part, churches have no idea how to hand off the mantle of responsibility. They don't have a plan for leadership. The book was even worse when it talked about corporations in America. Hey, listen to this. $500 million corporations. Those businesses in America that do half a billion dollars worth of business or more. 50% of them have no idea what they're going to do when the CEO steps down. 50% of businesses in America that do half a billion dollars worth of business have no plan to replace the chairman of the board. They basically function like that person will keep living forever. And here's the truth. I did the research. The statistics say that 100% of all people die, which means if you don't have a plan to replace the current leader, to fail to plan is to plan to fail. And this is so important that this is one of those areas that the church just can't get wrong. I'm not just talking Calvary Baptist Church today. I'm talking all churches. It's too important to get this area wrong. So what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes, it's a principle of life, not just the principle of leadership. If you only focus on what's in front of you, if that's all you're looking at, you will never be ready for what's coming in the future. You'll never be ready for what's waiting around the corner. And most people are so overwhelmed by the circumstances that are right in front of their face that they can't get away from them far enough to learn from the past. They can't step away from what's happening to them right now to be able to plan for what's coming in the future. Let me help you understand it this way. I don't know anything about the game of hockey, but I do know this. Almost universally, every hockey fan would say the greatest hockey player of all times was a guy by the name of Wayne Gretzky. In fact, so great that they referred to him as the great one. When people started asking Gretzky, how is it that you're able to do stuff on the ice that other hockey players in the history of the game have not been able to do? Gretzky made this very profound statement. He said, it's simple. I don't skate to where the puck is right now. I skate to where the puck is going to be. And I get to where the puck is going to be when the, before the puck gets to where the puck is going to be. Gretzky said, I play the game for what's coming in the future. I don't play the game for what's happening right now. Now, ESPN did this 20 greatest Wayne Gretzky plays of all times. I'm going to show you number four. And in this clip from number four, I want you to notice where Gretzky is before the puck even gets there, before he scores what ESPN considers the fourth greatest goal of Wayne Gretzky's career. Tonight, you become the greatest. Wayne Gretzky is at a spot on the ice that nobody else is at before the puck even gets there. And because of that, Wayne Gretzky scores a goal that you really can't even defend against. When it comes to leadership, here's what the great leadership guru of our times, Jim Collins, wrote on his website, an article on his website about transition. He said, you aren't a great leader unless your organization, unless your company, or we would say unless your church is great long after you're gone. You can't call yourself a good leader unless you're preparing your 
your, your organization or the folks that you lead for the future. This is true of parents in the home. This is true of pastors in the church. This is true of all walks of life. Now, the Bible gives us some pretty good examples of transition of leadership. Elijah, the famous prophet of the Old Testament, hands his responsibilities off to a prophet by the name of Elisha. David hands the leadership of Israel off to his son Solomon. Jesus prepares 12 guys to take over for him after he's gone. And even the great apostle Paul has a young buck by the name of Timothy who Paul is pouring into and getting ready to take the leadership responsibilities when Paul leaves. But the one example, and by the way, all of these examples are a little bit different. There's no two examples that are the same. But the one example that the Bible devotes more time to than others is Moses handing off the leadership responsibilities to Joshua. If Moses failed at this, I don't think we call him the second greatest leader of all time. But Moses has been preparing somebody for a long time to step in and to take over when he's gone. And that leader is a guy by the name of Joshua. Here's what we're going to learn today. How do we as a church prepare for change for the glory of God? Not just for the good of Calvary Baptist Church, But how do we prepare for change for the glory of God? And I hope you're as excited as I am when we're done with this sermon about where Calvary is headed in the future. I want you to take a few notes down as we go along today. If you're going to write in that worship guide and fill in some blanks, would you please write this down? If you're going to be a good leader, you can't wait until the day that you start to get ready to leave to to, to transition. You need to find the next person now. Now, we're going to look at four chapters of the Bible from Deuteronomy. Relax, I'm not going to read all four of them. We're going to start in Deuteronomy 31. We're going to move through 34. Today, when you get home, go back and read the rest of the details. But I want you to see how Moses prepared Joshua to step in and to take over after Moses leaves the leadership responsibilities. Starting in Deuteronomy 31. I'm going to read verses 14 and 15, then we'll skip down to verse 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, the time has come for you to die. Call Joshua and present yourself as at the tabernacle so that I may commission him there. I'm going to stop. The language in the Bible today is loaded with official terminology. Picture that you're Moses for just a second. God just told you ahead of time you're about to die. Imagine how that conversation is going to go between you and God when he says, hey, Moses, get ready because today you're going to die. And in order for you to get ready, you have to prepare somebody else to step in and to take over for you. And the first language that we see up here is that there is a call. Then there's this presentation and finally this commissioning. Here's how it, works. Here's how it reads. Then the Lord said to Moses, the time has come for you to die. Call Joshua and present yourself at the tabernacle so that I may commission him there. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves at the tabernacle, and the Lord appeared to them in a pillar of cloud that stood at the entrance to the sacred tent. And the Lord commissioned Joshua, son of Nun, with these words, Be strong and courageous. For you must bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give to them. I, Joshua, will be with you. Let's go back to this language in the Bible. The word call that you see up here on the screen, this isn't the, hey, Joshua, come on over here for a second. God wants to say something to you language. This is official language. This is the language that a church uses when they call a pastor. It's something saying, God has already selected the person. We're just trying to figure out who God has selected. And when we figure that out, then we call them or invite them to take over the leadership. The presentation word here is the kind of word the Old Testament would use for a promotion ceremony. This is awesome. Moses you're going to get a promotion. Actually, Moses, you're getting the ultimate promotion. You're going to get promoted from here on earth to heaven. And in order to clear room for the next leader, you get promoted to heaven so that somebody else, Joshua, gets promoted to fill in in your place. And notice, it's God who's presiding over this promotion ceremony today. And then there's a commissioning. All you military folks in this room, you know what this word means. 
There's official language that says, I'm setting you apart to do something, and I have the authority to set you apart for it, Joshua, and here's the task that I'm commissioning you to do. Here's the thing that I'm wanting you to do for me. All of this happens at the tent, and I want you to notice that God is making the same promise to Joshua that he made to Moses. Moses was a great man. Moses was perhaps the second greatest leader, apart from Jesus, the second greatest leader to ever live. And what made Moses great is this face-to-face, one-on-one relationship with God. Notice the last sentence on the screens. Moses is saying, God is saying, Joshua, don't freak out. I know that there's a lot writing on this, but I'm going to be with you the same, day, the same way that I was with Moses. And as long as I'm with you, you don't have to worry. Listen, leadership transition is hard. This kind of change can be very delicate in an organization. This kind of change can disrupt. There are a lot of churches that are fragile and don't make it through this kind of change. It's a hard thing that's a process which takes practice. You don't just stumble your way through it. To fail to plan here is the plan to fail here. And I want you to hear something about the church, not just Calvary Baptist Church, but the church in general. The church is not an organization. The church is an organism, which means it's a living, breathing thing. And this is true of all living things. Any living thing that doesn't change to adapt to its environment dies. In all of life, plants, animals, people, churches, the challenge is as the organization changes, the organism has to, as as the environment changes, the organism has to change to adapt to the environment or the organism dies. It's change or die for all living things. It's change or die for the church. It's change or die in ancient Israel's case. And there's a lot writing on this. And what the Bible is trying to say to us today is there is no lasting success if there is no successor. Moses has been preparing a young man for a long time. Apparently for almost 40 years, Moses has been investing in Joshua so that when this day comes, Joshua is ready. If you're in a position of leadership, it doesn't matter what it is, in the home, in the community, in this church, I challenge you, start today to start looking for the person who will ultimately replace you. I asked the elders of our church to start with me on the first year that I was here, praying through and talking through who would, receive, who would replace me one day. For the good of Calvary Baptist Church, we, we need to know that. And here's what I'm asking everybody in this room. Prepare somebody today to take your heart and to carry your heart on after you're gone. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. Pass on your passion for Christ. Now I'm going to give you a sentence in just a second, and this sentence is probably the most important thing you're going to hear me say all morning long. In fact, you can just forget the whole rest of this sermon as long as you remember this one sentence. This sermon, or this sentence summarizes the entire sermon. Are you ready? I want you to write this down, put it in the notes in your worship guide, put it in that personal note section of your mobile app. Here's what I want you to remember. The most valuable thing that you can pass down to the next generation is your heart. Listen, your money is going to evaporate after you're gone. All of your family heirlooms, those things can be sold at auction after you're gone. But if you take your heart, your passion, your faith in Jesus, and you put it in the chest of somebody else, that can't get taken away. That continues on long after you cease to exist. The most valuable thing that you will ever pass on to somebody else is passing on your heart, your passion for Jesus Christ. And you see this pretty clearly today in Deuteronomy 32. Listen to the generational language that you hear in the Bible when Moses passes down the responsibility to Joshua. Deuteronomy 32, starting in verse 44. So Moses came with Joshua, son of Nun, and recited all the words. Look up here on the screen. That song that we just sang today, that second song that we sang today, the song of Moses, this is Moses' last official act as leader of Israel. He leads them in the very same song that we just sang. 
Moses came with Joshua, son of Nun, and recited all of the words of the song to the people. And when Moses had finished reciting all of these words to the people of Israel, pay close attention to what the Bible says next. He added, take to heart. This doesn't need to be in your head. It's not just simple things that you do. This should be at the heart level. Take to heart all the words of warning that I give you today. Pay close attention to what it says next. Pass them on as a command to your children so that they will obey every word of these instructions. Moses is saying, Joshua, I am putting my heart into you. Joshua, you put your heart into parents. Parents, you put your heart into children. Children, you put your heart into the next generation. This is how the gospel continues to expand until it goes all over the world. But if there's a break in this chain, this could be the end of Christianity in one generation. If you fail to win, if you fail to pass on your passion to the next generation. Verse 47, these instructions are not empty words. They are your life. By obeying them, you will enjoy a long life in the land that you will occupy when you cross the Jordan River. He's saying, I'm not just giving you some simple written contract that's an agreement between me and people, between people and God. No, what I'm giving you is the very thing that I want you to build your life on. It should be at your heart, at your soul level, and everything about you is built on this relationship, this passion, this kind of faith. And because it's at the heart level, it impacts everything about you. But by the way, God is giving Joshua two words of command here. Obey this law, this song, this covenant, this contract, and you will live a long life in the land that I'm giving you. Disobey and don't expect to inherit the land at all. Don't expect to live for a long time. Obey and occupy, disobey and don't expect to be there for very long. It's not just something you build your, your uh, day on. This is life and death. This should impact you at the heart level. Calvary Baptist Church understands better than most because we've gone through it, the transition from one leader to the next. And this transition is not always easy. So I'm just going to go ahead and make the announcement today. One of these days, I don't ever plan to retire But I realize one of these days I'll get so old and decrepit that I'm not going to be a very effective leader anymore. And when that day happens, I plan to take a step back from the public uh, role here and become much more a behind-the-scenes role at Calvary Baptist Church. Here's the date. You can put it on your calendar right now. And those of you who want to see me leave, you can start counting down the days right now. March 15th, 2048 is the day that I plan to step down and to turn over the responsibilities to somebody else who can lead us well. Go ahead and start counting the days down now. You can make X's on your calendar as we move towards March 15th in the year 2050 or 2048. Look, for those of you who were uh, around and paying attention to the news back in 2013, the largest church in the world went through something that's almost never happened in history, a transition of leadership between one pope, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, to another pope. Back in February of 2013, Pope Benedict XVI voluntarily resigned from the office of Pope. He was 88 years old, and he said, I'm too old to keep up with the travel. It's not good for the Roman Catholic Church if I stay in the realm of Pope. The church quickly met together and selected Pope Francis to take his place. This is the first time that this act has happened since 1415 when Pope Gregory XII stepped down, but you really can't count that because the church didn't like him and they forced him to retire. The last time a pope voluntarily retired and didn't just die in office was Pope Celestine V in the year 1294. That's right, 723 years ago was the last time a pope stepped down and transitioned. Here is a video of Pope Francis showing up a month after 
Pope Benedict's retirement, meeting him at his house and these two living popes for the first time ever having a conversation with one another while the whole world watches. They spend some time together and the new pope meets with literally Pope Emeritus, Pope Benedict XVI. The Roman Catholic Church has been really careful about this. They don't want to give the world the impression that there are two people leading the church at the same time. So they've done their best to make sure that the world sees Pope Benedict is not really leading. He's enjoying the um, retirement. And Pope Francis is really the head of the church. So much so that you probably remember they just built a place for Pope Benedict XVI inside the Sistine Chapel where they can control people that have access to him. But even the Roman Catholic Church realizes this is so important, we don't want to mess this up. So we got to be really careful the image that we're giving to the world. The challenge from the Bible today is the passion that you have for Jesus Christ, your heart, you take that passion, that heart, and you put it into the heart of the next generation. Is there any parent in this room that doesn't want to see their grown children sitting in the same seats at the same worship service in the same church? I guess you can't sit in the same seats because that would be on your lap, but you know what I mean. Like sitting in the same church at the same time with them. Is there a grandparent in this room that wouldn't saw off your right arm to see your grown grandchildren that have turned their back on the church and on the faith find their way back into the doors of Calvary Baptist Church and worship in the same place with you at the same time. See, this is what it means to take your heart and pass it on to the next generation and then pass it on to the generation after that. And this is why Calvary invests so much time and so much money in children. Did you know that this summer, Calvary Baptist Church conducted three separate uh, kids' jam events in our church and in our community? More than 275 kids came to one of those things here in our church or in our community. There was several of them whose lives were impacted by Jesus Christ for it, but more than 90 volunteers from this church alone took part in what we did here, what we did at Waldrop Memorial or at Benning Hills Baptist Church. And we did it because we want to see the next generation impacted by King Jesus the way we're impacted by King Jesus. I got to give mad props to Pastor Frank Bowden and Steve Pate for what they did this summer and the impact that they're having with children. Look, if you want to know what it looks like to hand your heart off to the next generation, here's the lasting effect that it has. When you do this, and when you do this well, you're leaving a legacy for the next generation. This isn't just good for you. This is good for the church. This is good for the city. This is good for Jesus Christ and His glory when you take your heart and you put it into the heart of somebody else and it starts to beat in their heart after you're gone. Here's the way that Moses' transition ends when he finally steps down and Joshua steps in and takes over. And guys, let me just ask you, how would you like to step into the shoes of one of the greatest leaders in human history? How would you like to be Joshua taking on that responsibility? Deuteronomy 34, starting in verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in the valley near Beth Peor in Moab, but to this day, no one knows the place. Does that language sound weird to you? Here's what the Bible just said. Moses was such a great leader that God officiated his funeral service. And because he was such a great leader, the danger was that the people of Israel would go to his graveside and worship his graveside. And so God hid the place where he actually buried Moses so that the nation of Israel would have to look to a new leader. The Lord buried him there, and the Lord buried him in a place that no one knows to this day. Verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyesight was clear. He was as strong as ever. The people of Israel mourned for Moses. This is Joshua's first official act. The people of Israel mourned for Moses on the plains of Moab for 30 days until the customary period of mourning was over with. And if I'm Joshua, I'd be freaking out about replacing a leader like Moses. See, Joshua, the son of Nun, was 
full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands on him, so the people of Israel obeyed him, obeyed Joshua, doing just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Listen to verse 10. There has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, who the Lord knew face to face. The Lord sent him, Moses, to perform all of the miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts in the sight of all of Israel. Joshua is probably terrified at the idea of taking over for Moses. And Moses places his hands on this man, something like what we're going to do tonight at Calvary. And then the Bible uses language that's very unusual in the Old Testament. It says that Joshua now has the Holy Spirit on him. The same Holy Spirit that was leading Moses is now leading Joshua. And if you pay attention, as much as Joshua is listening to the Holy Spirit, as much as the people are listening to Joshua, it's actually the Holy Spirit that's leading Israel. It's not really Moses. It's not really Joshua that's leading Israel. The responsibility of the leader is to listen to the Holy Spirit and follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. What made Moses such a great leader? Is that he had this face-to-face intimate relationship with God. And Joshua carries that on when he meets God face-to-face at the Jordan River and God shows up and says, Joshua, I'm right here with you. Don't be scared. Be strong and very courageous. I came across some statistics. Let me listen to these statistics that scared the daylights out of me. March of this year, the Barna Group and Pepperdine University collectively studied churches in America. And they noticed a disturbing trend in churches in America. Here's the results of this study about all churches in America, all evangelical churches in America. They learned that roughly... um, Today in America, the median age of a pastor is roughly 54 years old. But in 1992, the median age was only 44. They found that there are more pastors above the age of 65 today, triple the number of pastors above the age of 65 today that there was in 1992. And this survey learned that only one in seven pastors in America is aged 40 or younger. But here's, when you put the math together, here's what Pepperdine University learned. Here's what the Barna Group learned. In one generation, what's about to happen in America is that there will be more churches than pastors. Because nothing is raising up, nothing is developing the next level of pastors. And churches across America are about to be in a very bad way. They're already saying that there are lots of churches that have become completely irrelevant to the next generation because the leadership of the church is so disconnected from them. So now let me tell you what's going to happen at Calvary as a result of this sermon today. And really, this is three years in the making three years of talking with the elders and meeting with the pastors and studying what we're going to do as a church to prepare ourselves for the future. I'm going to refer to this as the 2040 plan. This 2040 plan is what does Calvary Church look like in the year 2040, more than 20 years from now? What does Calvary Baptist Church and our ministries do? What are we become by the year 2040? And then we ask the, then I'm asking the question, What do the budgets and the boards and the buildings need to look like in order for us to get there by the year 2040? And here's one of the things that we learned. We have to start developing tomorrow's leaders today. And so in order for us to do this, we're going to create, starting next week, a pastoral residency program. This word is very intentional. Think about it like a medical doctor who goes to school for a couple of years. She learns all of the book stuff in the classroom, but nobody's going to let her be uh, on her own as a doctor. She's going to go follow around other doctors who teach her how to doctor stuff. And when she's been a resident for a little while following other doctors, then they send her out and they let her do her own thing. 
what t- churches typically do is they call a guy to be a pastor who has absolutely no experience leading whatsoever, and then they fire him after two or three years because he doesn't know how to lead. What seminaries do is they give you all of the book experience, all of the book education, but no practical experience, and then churches get mad when you have all of the degrees but no idea how to lead. So Calvary Baptist Church, starting in about a week, is going to start investing ourselves, and not just me, not just the staff and the elders, but all of us in this room, in raising up the next generation of pastors. These are pastors that we're going to invest ourselves in, raise them up, and listen to me carefully, send them out. And part of the contract is you don't stay here. We're going to make you a rock star as a pastor and then give you our stamp of approval, but you leave. And you go lead another church. You go bless another church. You go serve at another church. And maybe one day, if you're good enough, when Jeff dies of a heart attack, maybe you take over for Jeff because you've been leading in another church. But our hope is, our goal is, that they would lead another church in our community and our whole community would be better because of it. So starting next month, the first pastoral resident in our church is Josh Daniels. Josh, would you join me up here on stage real quick? Tonight, our church is going to meet together and be in conference, and we're going to bring three men before you for ordination. One is an elder, two is pastors. One of those two is Josh Daniel. And starting in the month of August, our church is going to make an investment in Josh. We're going to help him figure out what do we want in a pastor. We're going to make an investment and allow him to lead and give him responsibilities, and then we're going to let him make some mistakes. And after he's learned a few things by following us and by listening to us, we're going to send him out from here with the stamp of all of the members of Calvary Baptist Church saying, we made an investment in this guy, and he's rock solid when he leaves here. And any church in our city would be crazy not to hire him when he leaves here. I want you to notice something carefully. In fact, I want you to do this for me. Look in your worship guide or on your mobile app at the next steps. Go to the last next step. Because I'm going to ask everybody in our church to take the same commitment today. If you're a member of Calvary Baptist Church, I'm going to ask everybody, would you take this next step? Next step, number three, says this. It says, I will pray and encourage. And as much as God gives me the ability, I will be personally involved with, notice the word. It doesn't say resident, pastor, singular, It says pastoral, resident, plural, meaning Josh is not the only guy that we're going to do this for. God willing, we will do this for many years in the future until we're starting churches or impacting churches all over our community until our church is better for it and these pastors are better for it. And the idea is we're going to give you a safe place to learn and to grow and to make some mistakes. And when you leave here, you're ready to lead and ready to lead well. I should compliment our staff because our pastors have made some immense sacrifices in the budget to provide a paycheck for Josh to be able to lead us over the next year. And that leadership is just for him to learn some things and after he learns, to leave us. So I want to ask everybody, would every single person in this room make this commitment? I'm going to make an investment in Josh Daniels. And not just him, but the pastoral residents that come after him. And who knows? Maybe one of these guys will leave here and go serve another church in our community really well, and maybe one of these days they'll come back and serve us, and we invested in them on the early end to make them into a great pastor. But even if they never come back, Jesus' church will be better. The city will be better because of it, and I'm convinced Calvary Baptist Church will be better because of it. So I'm going to say a prayer real quick for Josh while he's up here on stage. I'm going to pray for you too. Because maybe you came in the doors, maybe you don't have this burning passion for Jesus Christ. Maybe your heart is a heart of stone, the Bible says, and not a heart of flesh. Because maybe you've really never committed your soul, your heart to Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray that maybe somebody in this room goes from death to life today by surrendering their soul to Jesus Christ. For the rest of us, I'm going to pray that you will make this next step at a minimum and start to pray and encourage and invest in this man and the people that will come after him.